Good morning. I want to thank uh, Bishop Chamnus and the committee for the invitation to do the Bible study for this annual conference. It's a great honor for me. It's a wonderful to be with you. We're going to have uh, discussion groups after each uh, presentation, and uh, the questions for that the discussion time will be on the screen at some point, uh, together with the primary biblical verse we're considering for the day. I'd like to ask uh, the person whose birthday is closest to today, to today to be the leader of the discussion. Uh, is there a birthday for today? Okay. Wonderful. That person is already appointed. Uh, if you'll, if the leader then will take uh, the discussion through these uh, two questions, and uh, I think some of you may be sitting within your own delegation from a congregation or a district. Some of you may be at tables that have uh, people from different congregations and districts. In either case, uh, we hope that you will prayerfully discuss our theme of uh, extravagant uh, generosity. Today I'm going to talk about God's extravagant gift. Tomorrow I want to talk about our gift of gratitude. And on uh, Wednesday I want to talk about um, our extravagant generosity in our own ministry and mission. First thing I want to say is that uh, the Memphis Annual Conference uh, does not have a financial problem. I can hear some murmuring from the floor saying, where art thou, Brother Meeks? Somewhere out in Looney Land? <laughs> We have, what I want to say, a memory problem. Now, memory problems don't happen uh, just with aging. I've discovered that the first sign you're getting old is that when you bend down to tie your shoe, you ask whether there's anything else you can do while you're down there. <laughs> memory, can, uh, memory loss can happen to young people. Memory loss can happen to an annual conference. So in these three days, I hope we can have a regaining of memory. Abraham said to Isaac one day, <clears throat> son, I'd like to upgrade my laptop computer so I can put Windows XP on it. And Isaac said, well, Pop, you, you can't do that. You don't have enough memory. And Abraham said, son, the Lord will provide the ram. So think of these three days as our regaining our RAM, uh, our memory. The first annual conference that John Wesley presided over, the first annual conference ever in Methodism, took place in 1744. And the first three questions of that conference, I think, are still our questions today. And I'd like you to write these down uh, because I hope they will be uh, the agenda in your congregation. The first question was, what shall we teach? The second question was, how shall we teach? And the third question was, what shall we do? Those are the Wesleyan questions. Those are the questions for this annual conference. Those are the questions for our congregations. Now the word teaching uh, is a translation of doctrine. That's all doctrine means, teaching. The Latin word from which we get doctor simply means teacher. My father-in-law was a physician, and he used to say, if a doctor does not teach you about your health, he or she should not be called a doctor. So the first question 
at the beginning of the Methodist movement was doctrine, was teaching. In our muddle today in the church, we're getting it backwards. We're asking first the question, what should we do? Without having clarity about what we shall teach and how we shall teach. I want us to think about these three sessions as a, a kind of a um, mini course on Wesleyan doctrine. And I want us to address our theme, extravagant generosity, from the perspective of Wesleyan theology on the one hand, and from the perspective of stewardship in the Memphis Annual Conference on the other hand. John 3.16, it's the most well-known verse in the Bible. I mean, it's at every NFL football game. Tim Tebow wears it under his eyes when he plays. But even though I like to watch a, a game occasionally, the NFL is not the proper context for understanding this verse. So as with all passages, we should look for its larger context in the scripture. So if you will, uh, turn with me to the third chapter of John, uh, the first verse, where we are introduced to a man named Nicodemus. And he's identified uh, just as a leader of Israel. He's a Pharisee, a leader of Israel. Now, I kind of think of ourselves, at least those on this area and the bar of this conference, as uh, Nicodemus. Nicodemus is well educated. Nicodemus has been set aside as a leader of Israel. And Israel is troubled and therefore its leader is troubled. Those on this floor, lay and clergy, are leaders in the Memphis Annual Conference. The Memphis Annual Conference is troubled, and therefore we, leaders, are troubled. And therefore, uh, we should think about approaching Jesus, as does Nicodemus. But Nicodemus approaches Jesus at night. It's as, it's as if he's not really sure about Jesus. Maybe, maybe Nicodemus knows more than Jesus about how to solve the problems of the annual conference, how to pro solve the problems of Israel. So he visits Jesus at night. Sometimes I go to United Methodist congregations, and during the whole worship service, I never hear the name Jesus mentioned. And then in tears, I say, we are in deep trouble as a conference. Because if you do not name God with the name Jesus, then we may be worshiping, worshiping any old God. And there are plenty of gods around in our society to worship. Everything depends, in the final analysis, on who Jesus is. So we come to Jesus like Nicodemus, the leader of Israel. We, we come with problems on our mind. Uh, General Conference didn't solve all of our problems. What are we going to do? We're running out of money. What are we going to do? Our, we're losing members. What are we going to do? You see, that's the question we ask first. What are we going to do? And Jesus gives Nicodemus, and I think this morning Jesus is giving us a gentle rebuke. No, no, it's not so gentle. 
he sang, It's time to stop the moaning and the groaning. It's time simply to stop talking about all our problems. And then he goes on to say immediately, what must be done? This is what must be done. You must be born from above in the water and the spirit. Oh Lord, do we have to do that? Can't we import some way of getting more money? Can't we import that from the world? Can't we import some way of attracting more people? No, says Jesus. You cannot enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and of the Spirit. That's the starting point. I think uh, we leaders of Israel, we leaders of the Memphis Annual Conference should be looking for revival in the Memphis Annual Conference. We Methodists are inveterate revivalists. The word comes from a French word, revivre, which meant, simply means to come alive again. If we want to come alive again as the Memphis Annual Conference, we will listen to Jesus. You must be born from above of water and the Spirit. And then he goes on to say, the Son of Man, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, must be raised up on the cross. Oh God, the cross? That's going to solve our problems. Yes. There is no other power for the church other than, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, the power of the cross. Amen. So, are we going to visit Jesus at night? Or is Jesus for the day? Is Jesus for the problems that we're facing? That's our question as leaders. If we have a memory, and that's a big if, we will know that the power which saves, the power which leaves, is the power of the cross. And then comes this stunning, stunning statement, for God so loved the world that God gave God's only begotten Son. This is the most radical sentence ever uttered in human history. It is a dangerous sentence. For it gives in one sentence uh, the whole of our faith. It gives in one sentence the way in which God intends to redeem the cosmos. So in these uh, first 16 verses, we have our whole teaching, our whole doctrine given to us. Um, I, I'm not uh, very good with uh, praise songs and the gestures you're supposed to do with uh, praise songs, um, but I, I learned from children at 61st Avenue in uh, Nashville a, a song that uh, I think is pretty good in trying to say what the first chapter of John has said so far. Uh, you may know this song, and uh, if, if somebody knows it, maybe they'll sing it before conference is over, sing it. Properly. I'm certainly not going to sing it. My siblings say I belong to the Society of Singing Impaired. Two of them are here uh, today. Uh, the song goes like this. Uh, you came from heaven to earth to show us the way. From earth to the cross, our debt to pay. From the cross to the grave, from the grave 
to the skies. Oh Lord, I lift your name on high. So let's, uh, let's pause here and, and try to develop a basic Wesleyan vocabulary. I, I think I'll be able to say confidently that revival is beginning in the Memphis Annual Conference when I begin to hear these words, not just the words, but, but what they mean. There are just four words that I want you to memorize today because uh, they are, I tell my students, if you give these words to any question, it'll be the right answer if you're talking about Wesleyan theology. The first word is grace. That's who we are. We are people of grace upon grace. Grace means God's gift. Secondly, love. Uh, this is, these are the two words Wesley uses the most, grace and love. Simply put, love, it's not the sentimental loves that we talk about in the world. Love means God's power over death, sin, and evil. Third is holiness. How often are you hearing that these days in your congregation or in the Memphis Annual Conference? Uh, that's, that's, a, that's our word. I mean, you can't really be a Wesleyan. And what's the use in being a Methodist if you're not a Wesleyan? You can't be a Wesleyan if you don't talk about holiness Amen. or God's righteousness. Now we're going to talk more about that uh, tomorrow and the next day. Um, I'll give you the simple definition that Wesley gave when he was, when he was pressed to say, now, now John, what do you really mean by holiness? His answer always was, love God. With all your mind, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That is holiness. And then uh, finally, this word I've already introduced, revival. Methodists were at the forefront of the first three great revivals that took place in Europe and Germany and America, the first revival beginning in the 1730s. Then in the 1800s to eight, mid 1800s, Methodists were at the revival in this country and that's the period at which Methodists started out as a very small group in America and became the largest denomination in this country. And then the third great revival gave us the social gospel and laid the groundwork for that great period of Methodism at the end of the 19th century up until 1968. That's the year the United Methodist Church came into existence. And since then, it's been a kind of a steady decline. Three great revivals. Now, some scholars say the fourth revival began in 1960s, and that's the kind of the right-wing evangelical revival. I'm waiting on a new Wesleyan revival. When you see revitalization, when you see the Spirit at work, then rejoice because the Memphis Annual Conference has a future. Now let's go back to the sentence, for God so loved the world that God gave God's only begotten Son. The first thing I want to point out is this. Um, it does not say for God so loved the church. 
The main theme of the world, uh, of the Bible, is God's passion for the world. This is the character of God's love. God loves everything and everyone God has called into being. And God will not let anything God has called into being go. The church exists for the sake of God's love of the world. If we could get that straight, we could understand how urgent it is for us to be a faithful church of Jesus Christ. The word for world in Greek in this verse is cosmos. God loves everything God has brought into being. The church is a subplot. Secondly, and here we come to a very important Wesleyan teaching. God gives preveniently. This is what Wesley called prevenient grace. God always gives first. And everything depends upon the gift God gives to us first. While we were yet sinners, Paul says, Christ died for us. No, no, it's, it's even deeper than yet. While we were yet enemies of God, Christ died for us. That's, that's the predication, that's the presupposition of everything in our faith. That God gives preveniently also means that uh, God gives whether we give back or not. God gives without assurance of anything in return. God gives preveniently, that means God never stops giving. We can turn our back on God, but God doesn't stop giving to us. God's grace doesn't depend on our response. And that's the reason we Methodists are are kind of strange birds uh, if we're Wesleyan. Because we became a distinctive Christian group on this question. We separated from the Calvinists, the Presbyterians, they're very close cousins. Wesley said that we're only a hair's breadth different from the Calvinists. But we separated them on the question of predestination. And Wesley developed the doctrine of universal atonement. It's not universal salvation. It's universal atonement. And what that means is that Jesus Christ died for every single human being. And not only that, for the whole of the creation. Do dogs go to heaven? Yes, they do. Everything God has called into being, everything... God loves so much that God gives God's only son does not ever stop receiving the grace of God. Prevenient grace also means that uh, God gives us everything we are. It's not just the things we have. We ourselves are a gift. There was a time when we were not. There will be a time when we are no longer here. And therefore, our lives are completely in the gracious hands of God. This probably is the most important thing for regaining a Wesleyan sense of stewardship, to, to understand that we are a gift. And as I'm going to say, that's The only thing God expects us 
to give back to God. And then finally, uh, prevenient grace means God gives God's self. This is an extravagant generosity. This is an extravagant gift. If we think in Trinitarian terms as we have to think, then that God gives God's only Son means that God gives God's own self for the sake of God's creation, for the sake of you, for the sake of me. That is an immeasurable gift. Now, that is such an immeasurable gift that the theological tradition in Protestantism uh, developed the doctrine of justification. And that's the second kind of uh, grace that Wesley talks about, justifying grace. Uh, this is the main doctrine of our Lutheran sisters and brothers and our Presbyterian sisters and brothers. And I, I want to stress very much that as Wesleyans, we agree on this doctrine. Sometimes we haven't gotten that straight. We, we agree on this doctrine. And what this doctrine says is that we cannot save ourselves. There's nothing we can do to earn our salvation. Uh, there's nothing we can give back to God that will assure our salvation. Our salvation. Why? Because uh, God, the theological tradition has said, God doesn't need anything. Why could, how could we give something back to God? Uh, but how can we return this extravagant gift of God's own life it's impossible. There's no way we could return that gift. And therefore, the uh, Lutheran and Calvinist traditions have stressed uh, justification, and Wesley, uh, read his sermon, The Lord of Righteousness, wanted to affirm, yes, I stand there too. But uh, Wesley introduces something beyond that. Wesley says God gives prevenciently. God gives in order to justify us. This is excruciatingly important for stewardship for our giving. Wesley, uh, more than any other Protestant theologian, emphasized the experience of grace and love. It's, it's, it's hard to say how, this, how important this is for Methodism it's not enough simply to understand justifying grace. The point is we have to experience it. And this is why preaching, faithful preaching, is so crucial for the Memphis Annual Conference. Preaching that names the name Jesus, that gives us uh, the narrative of Jesus in its fullness but preaching that in every sermon, in one way or another, expresses the gospel that has to be spoken directly to the people who hear it. And at the heart of the gospel is Jesus Christ saying to each one of us, I love you, I forgive you. Now, if people don't experience that, I, I mean, if they don't experience it in their bodies, in their bones, in their whole existence, if they don't hear it in a way that goes through their whole existence, don't expect any giving. Yeah. Or don't expect the extravagant giving that we need now. <laughs>
Now, the National Council of Churches say that uh, if you use the philanthropic rules of giving in, in our society, and often that's all the church is doing, then over a century, the 20th century, you can expect about 1.7% giving. And that's going down. But it's not uh, secular philanthropy that rules the church. It is this gospel of God's giving, this gospel of God's grace. Now, I, I want to say this as plainly as I can because I, I've been working at this a long time and I'm pretty sure about it. <laughs> Only loved and forgiven people will give extravagantly. Only people who have been forgiven will have the time and the energy to give themselves and to give everything they possess. And, and that's, what, that's the kind of giving we're looking for in the household of Jesus Christ. So uh, preachers, every time you preach, let your people hear the gospel. And don't expect any revival until people have experienced it and believe it deeply in their existence. Uh, the first time I came home from Duke Divinity School uh, to preach at my home church, St. Luke's, uh, I had a very sophisticated sermon. Uh, I've just been studying the ontological argument for the existence of God, and uh, I, I didn't say that, but uh, you know, something like that. And uh, as I saw the eyes of the people in the congregation glaze over, uh, I glanced down on the pulpit lamp, and emblazoned on it was this. We would see Jesus. That, that's, that's a Wesleyan statement. If you're not allowing the people in the best possible way to express it, in full narrative, if you're not giving them Jesus to see, to experience, don't expect revival. Don't expect extravagant giving. So we have uh, the doctrine of prevenient grace and the doctrine of justifying grace. And now we, we move on to what uh, is distinctively Wesleyan. And that's the, the doctrine of holiness, the, the doctrine of sanctifying grace. And here's where our Lutheran and um, Calvinist friends, and I have many of them, and I'm and often... Uh, I'm often in conversation and arguments with them. <laughs> this is the point where they begin to get nervous because they think the doctrine of uh, sanctification and the doctrine of holiness is about works righteousness. It's about doing something that earns our salvation. And Wesley said uh, already back in the 1750s, Wesley said, no, that's not what I'm saying. I agree with your doctrine of justification. We can't earn our salvation. But Wesley said scripturally, and he was right, God expects extravagant giving from us. God expects in a way, if you will, a qualified way, a return. The old doctrine of God is that uh, God has no needs outside of God's self. God, God is completely self-sufficient. Uh, Christianity sometimes has even taken over Aristotle's notion of God, that uh, God has no relationship outside of God, that uh, all God does throughout eternity is reflect on God's perfections. And that's the reason Aristotle was sure that God was a male, because what, that's what males are, are very good at. <laughs> 
my first teacher of theology at uh, Duke Divinity School, used to say, now, when uh, you all graduate and when you become theologians, I, my advice to you is uh, don't hang around children because children will ask you questions you can't answer. <laughs> and uh, nothing is more embarrassing for a theologian than a question you can't answer. But a child's question goes like this, uh, why did God create anything at all? There's no answer to that except a child's answer. Because God wanted somebody to love and to be loved by. So this, this is Wesley's contribution to the doctrine of God. What Wesley sees this power of love in God that is overflowing. God can't do otherwise than to love God's creation because God's nature is love. The shortest definition of the Bi in the Bible of God is the only definition with is in it. God is what? God is love. That's the very being of God. So that's what a child would say. God wants to be in relationship of love with those whom he has called into being and with God's whole creation. Sanctifying grace. Now what can we give in return? In the final analysis, uh, there are only two things we can give. First is our worship of God. And secondly is ourselves. I want to talk uh, in the remaining time this morning about worship and praise. And then tomorrow we'll talk more about sanctifying grace, about the gift of ourselves. Extravagant generosity, good stewardship, begins with worship. I've said already that uh, what we need in this conference is gospel preaching. And now I want to say what we need is gospel worship. Praise. Praise. That's at the heart of Wesley's understanding of holiness. God loved us first. God so loved us and the whole cosmos that God gave God's only begotten Son. Our only response that we can give is thanks be to God. Our gratitude, our praise of God. Worship is not a bargain with God. Worship is uh, not... I do this so that you do that. We don't control God in worship. Worship is sheer praise, sheer passion for God. I also leave in tears sometimes in United Methodist worship services. Um, because they're sloppy. We're not quite as much for order and decency as Pres Presbyterians, but Wesley was a good Anglican and he expected uh, order and worship. Uh, 
But there's a big difference between a ritual on the one hand and a feast on the other hand. Now, our preachers go to seminary to learn about uh, how to make worship orderly, how to plan it, how to make it somewhat like a ritual. But there's danger in that. Because if you plan a worship ser service so carefully that nothing can go wrong, then you may be risking leaving out the Holy Spirit. The difference in a feast is that you can expect something to go wrong. <laughs> you can expect something to be out of order because the Holy Spirit is leading. So you should plan worship carefully so that the Holy Spirit can lead worship. Uh, Wesley was very clear that uh, we cannot give praise of God without the work of the Holy Spirit within us. We won't have courage without praise. The world will not notice us if we're not praising. That's what makes the world kind of uh, open its ears and uh, eyes and say, what, what's going on over there in that church? These people are praising God when the world seems to be going to hell. What's going on there? They know something I don't know. Praise happens when we are so aware of God's gift, of God's self to us, that we can't do anything else but praise. Do you experience that? Do you experience that weekly in church? Or are your people experiencing that? We are so aware of God's loving and gracious presence that we exult in praise. So I would say that uh, worship and praise are our way of loving God somewhat in the way that God loves us. Praise comes from our love of God. Praise uh, is what frees us. True praise, not empty praise, but true praise is what frees us. Praise breaks the strangleholds of the false gospels in our society. If you're praising the God who gives God's own son, you cannot praise the gods of greed in our society. In a sense, uh, praise is the experience of true humility. In praise, we give up our possession of ourselves in order to be possessed by the Holy Spirit. Praise is putting yourself in the hands of God. In praise, you let go. You don't assume that you have to protect yourself against death and sin and evil because you realize you have no power against death and sin and evil. That power comes from God's resurrection of the crucified one. So if we're hearing uh, Sunday after Sunday Every Sunday is a resurrection day. If, if, we're, if we're hearing in one way or another every Sunday the message, the gospel of the resurrection, we are hearing that in Jesus Christ, God has destroyed death. And that this resurrection is a faithful promise that God will destroy death in the whole world. Cosmos. Now, if you believe that, I'm, I'm talking about really believing that. 
I'm talking about really believing that. I'm talking about experiencing that. Then there is no conceivable response except laughter and dancing. Expect revival in the Memphis Annual Conference when you see laughter and dancing in the church. Then people will want to know what's going on there. I uh, have as a deep wish that I could be a ballet dancer. My uh, creaky old football knees and my professorial inhibitions will keep me from being a ballet dancer on this side. But one day the Lord will make a ballet dancer out of me. But thank God there are many ways to dance. And everybody in your congregation can find a way of dancing, of laughter, and rejoicing if he or she hears this message. Death has been defeated. That's what the church lives out of. It lives out of this message of God's power over death. And there's no possible response to that. I mean, we don't have any power over death in us. We depend completely on God's power over death, and that means our response is praise. Every Sunday is not only a resurrection day, every Sunday is a reconciliation day. God was in Christ reconciling the world to God. That's Paul's theology. This is something that's already happened. It's too perfect. It is forever the case. The world is reconciled to God. That's part of our, our gospel. The problem of the household of Jesus Christ is to live in this reconciliation. So ex expect a revival in the Memphis Annual Conference when in the church people are discovering that the power of God's reconciliation is that different people can embrace each other and remain different. Every Sunday that lives from the extravagant gift of God is a time for us to embrace. Worship is a political moment. Worship uh, in that moment of praise means that we're all giving up possession of ourselves, we're all giving up our claim to rulership. It means God in Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, reigns. And not the others. Not us, and not the others. That's a political moment because it says all power and all kingdom belong to the triune God. Republicans and Democrats can embrace. You wouldn't know it from the god-awful campaign that is already underway. Republicans and Democrats can embrace in the extravagant gift of Jesus Christ. And they can find out that uh, what God in Jesus Christ is expecting from us actually needs both Democrats and Republicans and that we need to be reconciled through the power of praise. Now, we are tempted to come to Jesus at night <laughs> 
we're, we're tempted to keep our worship and our praise uh, at low key. Because uh, sometimes we have a sense it's embarrassing to be a Christian. Sometimes we're not certain we want to see, be seen with Jesus in the day. And that's the reason that uh, the only blessing in the New Testament that is not already contained in the Old Testament is this. Blessed is she or he who takes no offense at me. We are the people who take no offense at Jesus. And we want to be seen with him in public and we want to stand up in praise because our conviction is that the only power stronger than sin and evil and death is found in that gift. So I, I think uh, the, a sign of a revival is when we get over our embarrassment to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. If we are really sober about it, I think we have to admit that the first reason we are losing members is that we're losing our own children. If we were not losing our own children, we would not be declining. Why? I think it's because the church looks too much like the world. And our children see the church and, and say, well, if it looks so much like the world, I'll, I'd rather choose the world. It's more fun. Worship should not look like the world. It's, it exists for the sake of the world, but it should not look like the world. In worship, we know that we are in the world, but not of it. In the Seder meal, our Jewish, and brother, our Jewish brothers and sisters um, celebrate a meal like we do. And at that meal, the mother or father does some strange liturgical act that causes the children to ask, why are we doing this? Why are we living in this way? And that's the occasion for the precious story that makes us who we are to be told. And it always begins one in one way. It's our story too. It's, it's not just a Jewish brothers and sisters story. Once we were slaves, and with an outstretched, gracious arm, Yahweh brought us out of the economy of slavery into the household of freedom. That's a story that will catch the imagination of our children and of all the children in your community. But it has to be accompanied by a different living a different worship, a different kind of praise, a different shape of life, a different ethos. That's what's going to make our children want to be in the church again. So everything begins with our response to this extravagant generosity of God. We bring our problems in this annual conference, just as Nicodemus brought his. We have a lot of problems, and we don't know what to do. Let us remember that the first two questions are, what do we really believe? What do we teach? What is our doctrine? And how do we teach it?
I hope you share with me a profound hope for the Memphis Annual Conference. We're going to talk uh, the next two days about uh, some of the gifts we've been given. We are a gifted people. And there is no reason that God cannot raise among us a powerful revival. Thank you. The questions appear on the screen. Okay, maybe the questions can be put back on the screen. So now if uh, the one whose birthday is closest today will begin the um, discussion. And uh, if, if anyone in the group has questions you want to raise to me or um, uh, any criticism or anything you want to discuss further, then let the uh, person who's leading the discussion hand those questions to me. I hope you have a fruitful, holy conversation. Thank you. Let's take uh, about 15 minutes now to discuss these questions among us, among ourselves at the tables. <laughs> 